<laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good, yes. Um, I would uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Christoph Egre. Um, I'd like to welcome him back to the university. I realise it's um, 14 years since he last gave a lecture here. And it's, it, it, honestly, the talk was really good the first time. I'm sorry it's taken us so long to... Uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> 14 years, <laughs> <laughs> come on. <laughs> uh, I knew Christoph a long time ago. We used to work together in a practice. Um, I was a sort of junior, made tea, made models, things. But he was the, running a big project. He was the job architect for um, Peckham Library and set up his practice uh, about 12 years ago, I think. Yeah. Um, and urban design and architecture. And, these, and what's interesting about, as well as all the new projects they're doing, he was involved in the refurbishment of the Park Hill housing uh, estate in Sheffield, which is an enormous, great public housing project, <coughs> um, which I went to go and see years ago before refurbishment, so it's good to see it before and after. But um, he's now working on the Balfour Tower, Erna Goldfinger's building in Bow, um, and I think you might talk a little bit about that. But thanks for coming back. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about, oh, I'm getting a real echo here. If I, uh, if I move this way. Oh, ah, ah, OK, thank you. Um, I, um, I'm going to cover about. So I have to move this away, yeah. so then I get the light in my face. OK. okay. <laughs> no, no, it's OK, it's OK, it's OK. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk, I think I've got, uh, I've got 105 slides, so I'm going to go a little bit fast, because you probably want to be, I, I want to be out of here by in an hour's time. So uh, <laughs> I've got dinner at 8 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if you have a question, you have to be very quick. Um, this is our studio. Uh, this is David, my business partner, David West. Uh, and 12 years ago, David and I decided to come together and build a practice that we call a studio uh, that brings urban design and architecture together. And it's, it was really, uh, we thought, oh, everybody's going to copy us and everybody's going to do the same. And strangely, uh, some people do 20% of architecture and 80% and of uh, urban design, but it's very rare that people actually work together and think about what's inside the red line boundary and then what's outside of the red line boundary at the same time. And, and it's a great, it's a, you know, as young students, it's a really good way of uh, approaching architecture because you're thinking about when you're thinking about urban design, you're thinking about strategy, you're thinking about how people are actually going to live in places rather than just being obsessed with my building, my walls, my fen fenestrations, and so on. Um, and so you think, urban designers think in a strategic way. They think about how to get from here to there. They think about green, green threads. They think about transport. They think about uh, what kind of businesses are going to work in, at ground level? How can we make meanwhile uses or permanent uses? Uh, what is going to be the, the tone of a place? And then it's a really clever thing because um, it allows you when, you, when you do a master plan or a framework plan, as we prefer to call it, um, you then get introduced to lots of different parts of a, of a master plan and you get to say, oh, I'd like to do this bit of the building or, the, or give the tonality to, the, to a place. Uh, and, you'd, and the last thing you want to do is to do the whole, the whole building, the, the, the whole master plan. Uh, and our, our studio is uh, a studio, as, but it's also on the ground floor. It's very visible. It's uh, practically like a shop. And we have re uh, regular talks and we have exhibition. So, our practice has become a kind of naturally extrovert and inviting of other people, inviting of collaboration with other architects, inviting of artists and people who don't do architecture. And indeed, uh, I'm telling you now, but we're about, oh, it's our 12th anniversary next Thursday, and as of next week, we'll be opening a bookshop in our studio, and the bookshop will be uh, about our favorite 
our favorite books and all the people who come have to donate a book and the books will be sold for charity in six months time and so it's a, it's a way of uh, of get, of being able to open a book before you go to Amazon to buy it. Um, and we have exhibitions about India and how we, you know, India, we, we thought we taught everything to India, but actually it's India that is actually teaching us about street life and security at ground level and cleverness of uh, cooking utensils and food and all of that. And, and so we did an exhibition about how, we've, how we can learn about India and recycling and things like that. Uh, we, did, we did a recent project about how uh, uh, we could save a lot of money for the government by moving the whole of the Houses of Parliament to Bristol and create a hill. The hill would cost uh, approximately six, six billion pounds. Six, mil, uh, six billion pounds. No, the, the government was going to pen, spend six billion and we were going to, this building would cost about 1.5 billion, so it's saving the government 4.5 billion. Um, and, and so sometimes we do projects that are just for the fun of it or because we never get a chance to design a, a parliament building and therefore we wanted to know what, a, what the, 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 house, the House of Commons or the House of uh, Lords might feel like and we wanted to give our own interpretation. I'm telling you this because I'm telling you how we, how we think and how we... Um, we're kind of not quite in that kind of I'm an architect and I'm designing building kind of groove. Um, we, we also like invi invite other people. Somebody wanted to promote uh, flowers and greenery and so we filled, we had 10,000 allium plants in our studio and there was like a, a queue of hundreds of people outside our studio on the last day because they were going to give the flowers away. Um, this is our studio. We're about 60 people, uh, a variety of, and this, the nice thing about 60 people is that you can have graphic designers, model makers, urban designers, landscape designers, architects, technicians, interior designers, and you get this kind of a variety of talent. And, and I think that David and I's, most of our time is about managing talent. 60 people is a kind of the right number of people to, um, to know everybody's talent and at the same time know, oh, if I put Theo with, uh, with Mark and if I put Mark with Christina, then the project will go in this direction. And then if I add a little bit of David Grant and somebody else. And so we're always kind of um, mixing that. And then we're, we're designing practically in all the, uh, the boroughs of London or many of them um, and um, this is uh, one of the first projects that I wanted to talk to you about which is uh, the library building in Clapham. This was a really uh, a, a lovely building, a cathedral which is now called UNI, commissioned us to design uh, a residential building that had to include a new library for Clapham and the library had to be uh, free to the council. So the, the buildings above had to pay for uh, a library that cost somewhere in the region of 17 million, plus a health center, which was about another six or seven million. So the, the, the whole building above uh, had to be, had to be, to pay for that. Um, and our strategy was, and I, I was going to call this talk uh, The Harmony of Dissonance, which uh, um, uh, Will hasn't put on the poster, so uh, you don't know about that. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'll, ju I'll just say what, what, one quick thing about it. The Harmony of Dissonance uh, is, is just the, the, the name of it is like contra contradictory, uh, but it, it was the book that. Uh, well, we've, we've decided to change the title of the book, so don't worry about it. But I wanted to call the, our book uh, the, the Harmony of Dissonance. And what it is, is that rather than think of a building as a monolith, as something that is 
an object, which is a very much a 20th century kind of approach to architecture. We always think about our buildings as aggregation of one bit plus another bit plus another bit. A little bit, the, the, and the best analogy I can give is a, is a hill town village where you have a castle and then a church and then a main square and then a, a baker's and then a school. And little by little, the whole village becomes a composition. And, and this, it's done over 200 years or 300 years or 500 years. And it's quite nice that the nothing quite m fits in terms of styles. They are dissonant. And yet, when you see them coming together, the person who put the church next to the castle thought about the composition of those two things. And then the person who added the church felt thought about the composition. So the, I, the elements are dissonant and not harmonious, but the whole thing becomes harmonious. Uh, and I'm saying that because you're going to see a, in the, a lot of the projects that we, I'm going to show you, it's never the monolith building. It's always a little bit of a building and then a little low one and then a bit of a step back. And, then, and that kind of way of composing means that when you have a, a three-story terrace, how Victorian terrace, you can really easily go, oh, four, four story, seven stories, uh, and then you go up to 11 and 12 story. But the eye, when you ask people how tall this building is, so often they say, oh, it's a seven story building. It's actually a 13 story building. But because of the curves, because of the steps, because of the reflective material, uh, it doesn't appear to have that, that, that presence. And I think that monolith buildings tend to be fatter and bigger, and, and aggregated buildings tend to be more like gracefully uh, 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 accepting of their surroundings. Um, so the, the library is ev everything below my hand here, and then three or four meters below ground. So it's a kind of nine meter high space. And this was given to, it's, it's called a PPP, Public-Private Partnership. And it was, the, the council gave the, the land and, and the developer had to give the library and the health center and then make that profit out of the residential above. Um, I know it's a technical, technical talk, so I have to talk about a few materials. Uh, we, we, we used on, on, this, on this facade, uh, something called uh, split split uh, um, split bricks so they're thin thin bricks that are stuck together but they 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 they've kind of broken so they have a lovely texture on them and they've got a little bit of mica mica in them so that they are a little bit shimmering and then i insisted i insisted sometimes sometimes as architect you have to say i insist and because Developers and QSs, I hope there's not too many in the room, um, you know, they don't understand how 25 years or 10 years or 5 years of thinking about architecture has made you sure about certain things. And, you know, I said I would like the windows to be stainless steel and I would like them to be stainless steel so that at night time, you can, you can, they, they kind of shimmer and they, they come to life. And when you're inside, you can see in the reflection of, of the windows, and you can see things that you wouldn't see out of the window per se. And, and it's only afterwards, when the building was finished, that the developer said, that million extra that you cost me on those stainless steel windows was really worth it. So I'm just putting that seed in your, in your mind as, as, as young, young uh, architects. Sometimes you have to be so sure about what you you want that you insist on what on what it is you want. Um, and these and the the other thing that I I personally insist, but that's in the studio, is that people try to draw by hand. Some people draw superbly on the computer, and I let them be. But a lot of people jump on the computer, and everything becomes a straight line. Everybody, everything becomes uh, dead, sort of like the computer deadens the, the idea. And there's something extraordinary about using your hand, I'm left-handed, 
using your hand and drawing something that's come straight from your head without the use of a computer. And, 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 and then, you know, you go from that to that, and it's such, such a pleasure. And, and there are things that you can't draw with, I mean, there are things you can't draw by hand that you can draw with a computer, but there is a reverse, which is, you know, art, art, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, ex extraordinary art deco handrails can only be designed with um, beautiful hand drawing, I think. So all the time, uh, you, and you'll see this through the talk, uh, the, the, the sketch and the, uh, and, the, and the building kind of talk to each other. And I guess, I guess Will, Will Alsop was the kind of uh, the person who instilled in, I mean, before that, Nigel Coates and a few other people I've worked with, or have always been people who've enjoyed uh, capturing the essence of what they imagine in their mind about space in the form of drawing, sketching, uh, or other, other forms of, of art. Um, and I think it's, you know, that's an, another tip I want to give you, which is that um, drawing captures the essence of what you're trying to do. Uh, the reason we used uh, brick split, split, uh, uh, slips was also because we were on some six meter tight radius, and therefore if we had used a really thick uh, brick, it would have been in, in, the, in the way of itself. So we were able to just get these small shadows on, on the brick. Um, but it also made the brick, I have a problem because, you know, in my mind, a brick is a brick and it should be a brick. And then a brick slip seems to be like a cheaper version of a brick. But it makes the building lighter. It, didn't, it meant that the building didn't need to be scaffolded. Uh, there was all sorts of, of great advantages. And actually, if you think of the brick as just a waterproofing membrane that is going to be durable and can be sandblasted in 15 years' time to clean it, it's actually not a bad material. And this is the plan. So the, the library is, is here. The health center is down here. And then on the, on the flats above, um, the, the, the other clever thing about this building is that rather than having one corridor and apartments on either side, we managed to use a little bit more width and get one, two, three, uh, an arrangement of three uh, uh, apartments and, and then a semi-corridor along here, but just one lift core and one means of escape. So in terms of efficiency, we had quite a lot of flats per, per floor. And then by curving and opening, we made sure that every flat had a good view and good sunlight. This is the elevation. This is a section of, of, the, of, the, of the library itself. What, a, what, I, what I like about that is that, I, th I thought I had a picture of inside the library, um, is that the main space, what, what normally should be where, uh, where you, you keep calm, we said we would put the children in the center. And putting the, cent the children in the center made the, the place immediately theatrical. Like, they make noise, they are happy, their mums are there, and they all talk to each other. And it becomes like a Shakespearean theater. The library becomes not the quiet place that we're used to, but a, noise, a noisy-ish place. But if you want, and then the books are behind the spiral, and behind the spiral itself are these little uh, spaces where you can be quiet and write your thesis and so on. So we kind of reversed the way the library is imagined. Park Hill. Park Hill was a project we started, uh, so we were 12 years old, and we started it, I think, when we were like three years old. So that's, uh, and it took, se it's taken seven years, so it's sort of been on, on our drawing board for a long, long time. Uh, and it was really, um, I, I'm, I, I'm so pleased that so many people uh, enjoy this building. But the first time we went to this building, that's what we saw. And it was like 
we were really want to do this project because you know it really didn't it didn't feel loved and actually this building was you know at 11 o'clock of 12 o'clock of being completely demolished until somebody somebody said uh, that English heritage should protect it and it became a grade two star listed building and suddenly somebody had to do something about it and Tom Blotsam and Urban Splash from Manchester decided to um, have a go. They, they suffered for it because there was a big recession in the middle of the process and they nearly went, uh, they went bankrupt, but they survived. Uh, English Heritage and a few other bodies helped them to finish the building. Um, and I guess that uh, one of our obsession in the studio is uh, what we call second life, is a building has been built, it's sort of, it's 50 years old, 50, 60 years old, and you know, you could decide to demolish it or you could decide to give it a second life. And, and what was so wonderful is that the person, Tre Trevor Mitchell is his name, at English Heritage, was the coolest English Heritage person I've ever met. And he said, look, I know that you're going to have to make a few changes. I, I've got a rule, and the rule is the squint test. And if I squint and I can still read the, the essence of Park Hill, then it will pass my test. And so it meant that we were able to go, you know, some mean English heritage person might have said, that has to be replaced with exactly the same brick. And that fenestration should have been the same. But it would be stupid because that window was designed when the regulations for windows, the technology for windows was completely different. And, you know, you can see that here it feels like, like you're in incarcerated and there is not enough daylight and, and all the rooms are tiny and small. And so we were able to say, okay, when you squint, what you read is the grid. So let's get the concrete right. And let's, let's restore the concrete to, its, to perfection. And then let's say that the, the, solid panel the solid panel becomes the equivalent of the, the glass panel and, and reverse and get twice as much light on, on the whole facade. And, and it's, for me, the, 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 the two pictures at the very top, top right, are really wonderful. One is, is kind of saying, don't look at me. And the other one is kind of saying, look at me, I'm colorful, I'm, I'm, I'm a building that is part of your city. Um, and then most of the problems with 1960s building is not so much the building. The buildings are, you know, Parker Morris standards in terms of space, uh, really good quality construction, gashy uh, rubbish system, uh, unified centralized heating system. You know, the, the whole architectural bit is really well done. It's the ground floor. It's, the, it's those horrible, uh, I'm a green space, but I don't know what I am. You know, and if you turn that and you say, oh, it's a place for picnic, it's a place for children to, to to play, if you put a lot of investment in, in what's called the public realm, then you bring buildings to life. And so, so many of the 60s buildings, and I'll talk about the Balfron in a similar way, um, you find that landscape, and actually that's, I should have said that we now have five people doing landscape design in our studio because it it's unlocks so many issues about uh, uh, framework plans and architecture sketching, obviously, and then repairing the concrete. I told you the squint test, the concrete, just showing where the, where the repairs were. In the, in the 60s, they didn't put enough depth in the, in the, in the, for the rebars to be protected from water ingress and, and rust. And so we, rep we repaired them. We put some new balustrades that were cast rather than these ones. We chose a, a, a color palette if you look carefully at this facade, you can see that you've got a dark brick and then a, a lighter brick, and then it goes, it has different tones, and these different tones relate to the streets in the sky, and, the, and, and each street in the sky relates to three, three levels in the building. So we thought we'll use three, three colors, and those three colors will relate to the, or, or, or the brick but 
rather than make them bricks, we'll make them anodized aluminium, which has a shimmer and a way of talking back to the city. And then, rather than hide the staircases, we put them on the outside. And rather than hiding the lifts, we again, we have the most amazing views of the hills of Sheffield and two glass, sh like a moment of luxury in a, in a kind of moment of a social housing uh, building was really like the, the gesture that Tom Bloxham and Urban Splash knew how to, to add. And then inside, we, op we opened the, the, the plan. The, the inside was not uh, as listed as the outside. And so by removing all the bars on the windows, you really feel like people were saying, I've got a penthouse overlooking the, sh the, 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 the hills of Sheffield. And people really enjoy these flats, and they're not expensive. They're like, I think they're still under 200,000 pounds each. Um, a bit of shimmer, uh, a bit of nursery at ground level, the mixed uses, uh, reinventing the uses at ground level, so th and, and breaking a lot of work went on into the landscape because what we wanted to do is Park Hill was like a place that people didn't go to. It was like a ghetto. And what we wanted in our mind from the first moment we drew was it has to be like another part of the city and you just walk there and go to the best bakery and the best fish and chips, the best nursery, the and offices at ground level. Uh, these are, you can see quickly in the plans that rather than, you know, in the 60s you had small rooms that were all interconnected and today we all think about uh, the flat arrangements as being really open and, and connected because, because kitchens have extractors <coughs> and, and, and we have far, far, far uh, sprinklers and far um, alarms that tell us if there's a fire in the kitchen before it's too late. So we don't need to compartment, and also it, then you get more light and you get more, more space, and more sense of space. Um, the shawl was a building that uh, we were invited to, to look at just before the Olympic Games. Uh, the Olympic Games, big staircase to Stratford was uh, facing this really uh, gray shopping center, and they essentially wanted us to build some trees to hide the building. But there was no time to build, to put, to grow the trees. So we imagined the shawl, which is, it's like a shawl of fish that is flying through in front of this building. But it's also like artificial trees. Uh, and they were sort of placed around that uh, gyratory system that is uh, Strat Stratford Island. And insi inside of it is this shopping center that's going to change over the years. But this screen, uh, kind of, you can still see the building. You're not hiding the building. But somehow, there's like a veil. And that veil is smiling back at you. And that veil is, um, is made of, 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 of uh, sort of petals of titanium. And we had a lot, well, really a lot of fun because this is me going technical again. Um, if, you, if, you, if you dip titanium into water with an electric current of 23 volts, it goes blue. If you go to 28 volts, it goes green. And if you go to, and it changes color, and it, it changes color inside the metal. Um, so we, we, were ma we managed to get, this is, it, it was not the most sustainable project because the titanium had to be bought, I think, somewhere in Europe, had to go to Japan to be anodized, then uh, to be anodized, then came back to be shaved somewhere else, and then finally came to, to England. Um, <coughs> but we got these lovely shades, like practically following the, uh, the, the colors of the rainbow of uh, greens and yellows going into reds and uh, oranges further down. And they're, they're on, on two pins at the top, and then there is a big spring here. And so on the, on the good windy day, it has to be quite windy, I am, I'm afraid to say, the, those leaves actually move like the leaves of a, of, of, of a tree. Uh, and 
And for, for us, that was a really lovely project because it is not really architecture, but it is. Uh, and yet it was technical and it was, it was kind of um, practically an, uh, uh, like pretending to be nature, to be like moss or greenery or something like that. <coughs> and then the nice thing is that at night time, if you, you have the lights at the ground and you just shoot the light upwards <coughs> and then they shimmer. And even, if most of them are facing north, but they catch the light from, from, the, from the sky rather than from the sun. And they, and they, sh they, they throw back daylight. Um, and then behind, uh, probably that's, that's our, our slight disappointment is we tried to get them as thin as possible, but because there were so many cables here, those, those legs had to be a bit like elephant legs rather than nice, delicate legs. Um, but they were really clever in the way that they interconnected with each other to give that overall stability. And they're really, they're essentially titanium clad and then inside it's, it's uh, pl uh, plywood. Balfront Tower. Um, Balfront is the sister project, the older sister of the Trellick Tower. You, you mostly know the Trellick Tower, which is in West London. Uh, the Balfront is in East London and was designed two years before the, the Trellick Tower. And so is practically the, the template for the Trellick Tower. There are, there are many small differences, but in essence, it, uh, it's a building which says vertical circulation, technical services in one tower, then a, a little bridge, and then the residential accommodation. And it, it's actually a, a, a really La really elegant idea, and there's so many stor stories about this building. The, the way that you you arrive at it as if you were on the moat, above a moat, and crossing onto into a castle and going into this entrance, and yet there are so many things that just don't work, and you know this kind of idea of second life is a really good one because rather than repeating the mistakes of the past you kind of, you have a second go and you say, what was Erno Goldfinger thinking? For he was thinking about space, he was thinking about views, he was thinking about light, he was thinking about wonderful, clever things. But he missed the acoustic issues or the wind issues or the, the sense of entrance or arrival. So we have, you know, if we're, if we're not too arrogant, we can go and say, Erno's brilliant. And actually, Erno, his wife and him lived for three months in the building and his wife took notes from complaints and comments of people living in the building. So he was interested in making it better. He was thinking about how to make it better for the Trellick Tower. But he was thinking about, he didn't think that this building had to stay like it is forever. Um, and again, this is, this is a tower, it's a funny angle, but that's, that's a tower, and that's the service tower, and that's the main building. But the great, you know, you have to think in urban design about how to get from the, the, the train station, how, what the sense of arrival might be. Um, because these are, those buildings tend to succeed or fail depending on, on how, how you arrive at them. So in the first thing we did, practically the first, first thing we did was to draw how, how we would deal with the public realm, how we would put some new, new, new planting. And it's so important, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of labor the point, in the densification of London and all the big metropolis, you know, we're removing that sense of nature. And, and the sense of nature is what probably keeps us sane. It's when you hear the birds, it's when you see the leaves move in the wind, it's when you see the rain falling on plants that you know that you're still within nature rather than in a computer game. 
And therefore, you know, if you want to avoid people becoming alienated, you have to, that presence of nature is really important. And that, that sense of community and people talking to each other is, so, is more important, I would say, than the architecture itself. Uh, Balfron is, is more listed than Park Hill. Park Hill was like an inch away of its life being demolished. Uh, and this building is grade one, a uh, one listed building. And so we had to be much more respectful about the fenestration and how to deal. And this is before and this is after. And we've, you can see we've, we've improved the, that we've put the parapet back. Uh, we've made the planters really work. We've water systems that irrigates the, the plants. Uh, we've, we've tried to clear the, the, the glazing a little bit more so that when you're in the flat, you can see the view without having a bar just at the eye level and so on. And then we're improving the shops and improving the ground level and, and so on. But improving also that sense of arrival and just the, the smell of lavender as you, as you arrive or the transparency <coughs> of that door or the lighting around that, that frame. And so we, we kind of made a list of all the things that we would sort of improve. Uh, and this, you know, this is, this is again, uh, we had a kind of Park Hill moment where, mm, do we really want to do this job? It's really wet, horrible, concrete, fenced up. Uh, everything is going against you. And then you take a deep breath and you think, ah, but it's fantastic because of this. And then you think about all the good reasons for designing or redesigning this building. Like the bin shouldn't be there and get rid of those fences and uh, why is this community center so closed off and why is nobody, why is everybody putting, you know, why is that garden not working? And is that a good playground for a five-year-old? And asking ourselves these questions, which are, I can imagine, are not immediately your concerns in architecture, but they are very valid questions. They are architectural questions. And, you know, there is such an extraordinary tradition of uh, vegetation and raw, brutalist concrete coming together and being successful. They marry so beautifully together. Uh, so we had a field day. We, this is a view from the top balcony, improving the front garden, improving the health, the community center, creating a sense of entrance, improving the, the children's playground, uh, removing the barriers, allowing parents to see their children play within the pit. Uh, and then we dealt with the, with the elevation. The elevation went through original failed timber facade, into uh, PVC, terrible, disgusting, white, uh, uh, horrible, fat mullions. And then we went back to a lovely, deli delicate, aluminium anodized uh, frame. And we, we chose a color that is, I always find that uh, darker fenestration looks better because you allow the concrete to be, to read strongly. Uh, you know, that the white is just screaming at you and is kind of distracting you from the concrete, whereas the, the minute you keep the frame darker, then you're able to read the lightness of the concrete. Um, and then we went into the lobby. Look, wonderful things. A little bit of marble, you know, in this kind of social housing tower. Erno Goldfinger put some green marble. And it's like, so you, you have to, ah, okay, let's do it. Let's put marble. And let's put a reflective ceiling and let's put some nice 19, 1930s lighting at the top. We worked with um, Abe Rogers and uh, it was really nice. Abe Rogers and, I, and, and we uh, did designed the interiors of all the flats, half and half. And it just created that moment of tension. It's like, like with Park Hill, we worked with Hawkins Brown. Here we worked with um, Abe Rogers' design. And, is, is, I, and I would say, we, as much as possible, we try and work with other architects. And if, if you remove the ego of the architect, um, and we know who we're talking about, um, it's, it's a wonderful freedom because you, you can talk to each other and you can improve the architecture 10 times. Uh, 
uh, because it's no longer my architecture, it's architecture. Um, and then in that little tower, or that service tower, that used to have water tanks and boilers and so on, on each floor we changed it to a cinema or a, a yoga room or a dining room. And these, these are like really like gifts. So you, you live in a small one-bedroom flat or two-bedroom flat, but you can do the yoga or play the loud trumpet or invite some friends in the, in the dining room and you book it in advance or watch a film or watch a, f a football, f football game. Um, and that happens in the noisy bit of the service tower. So we had to be clever. We had to, for disabled access, we had to put some, some lift access along here and we had to deal with you know, lobbies and so on. And these are, are uh, some of the plans. And then because we wanted to change the plan and make them really modern, we, we, we negotiated with English Heritage that there will be one of each type of flat which would remain exactly like they were in 1960. And then Abe Rogers and ourselves did uh, a variation on so it means that when uh, London and Newcastle, who are the clients, go to sell the flats, it's not all the same flats. There are 25 different typologies with different bathrooms, different kitchens, different color schemes, and so on. Uh, the interiors kind of keep the essence of the 1960s. So there is this kind of lovely blue colors and uh, vinyl floor finishes and funny balustrades that can be dismounted to let the bed go up to the bedrooms and so on. Um, moving on. This is, this is a really good example of uh, the, har the harmony of dissonance in the sense that we were asked to do a building and it's in Fish Island uh, and it's on, on, it's, it's on Roach Road. And there's a place called Star Space, which is a, an artist community place with a cafe on the canal. And our developer wanted to board the site uh, just before the Olympics. It's, o it's overlooking the, the, sta the Olympic Stadium. Um, and our idea is, is to, was to avoid making one building. So instead of doing one building, we did one, two, three buildings and since there was already two pitches we thought we'd continue another couple of pitches and then we'd do a flat and the flat would link up with with this building which is existing and not of great merit um, and then we thought ah there's going to be a bridge here and we wanted to continue the artistic community so we we created a double height affordable workspace space that artists or an artist uh, company would rent to sculptors and painters and, and so on. And for us, this is the sort of building that we love, where the ground floors are mixed uses and the residential are above. And this, you know, at the moment, residential is always the element that has the value. And everything else costs money. And so all the time you, you make an argument that it's really important to keep ground levels vibrant and alive and full of people and, and they must exist and, and then we have to go a little bit higher and it was just a, a little, little bit of a battle with the planners to make the point. Uh, and what I really like about this is we, we, we created a communal, a communal terrace here. So, you know, how do you make people who live in flats get to talk to each other and if you have this this communal garden at the roof, that's, there's a good chance of that happening. And if there's a cafe here, people will talk to each other. The most important thing to do in an urban environment is getting people to talk to each other. This is really, um, you know, 25 years ago, I, w I lived in a street and I hadn't talked to my neighbors. And then five years ago, we had a, a jubilee summer party and the street did a, a I'm telling you that because suddenly I've talked to my neighbors and now we, I go to dinner and I talk to them and then they tell me about that plumber and I tell them about 
the music that my son is doing, and then, and, and then magic happens. But if you don't talk to each other, it's much harder for magic to happen. And therefore, try to make architecture where magic happens. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm showing you the, the drawing and then the, the building. And it's just that, that pleasure of, you know, the reason we decided on black timber is because on the canals, timber to build the city <coughs> arrived on, along the canal on barges. And then a lot of timber yards would be on the edge of, of, of the canal. And they would dry the timber that was still wet in these tim timber structures that had the wind coming through and would allow, the, uh, allow them to dry, but were protected from the rain. So this is a reference to, to, to what canal side <coughs> buildings could be or might be. Uh, and this is the facade. <coughs> And what we this is the this is the the canal side, this is the bridge side, and this is the road side. And I, I'm showing you all three because again, why why continue to do the same facade on all three sides when there are you know different orientations, the different sun conditions, different light conditions, different urban conditions, and therefore not not having one single style throughout gives you a richness. Uh, this is a plan, so there's an atrium, there is a lift, staircase, and then the canal side is here, one, two, three buildings that you no longer read that, that strongly in plan, but that you do read in elevation. And these were the, the kind of the references and the materials that we used. Next door is, is Death Road, very similar building. Uh, this, the, the, the building here that you can't quite see on this sketch is a, a horse hotel. Horses used to pull barges. Barge, horses then used to get very tired. They would go to the hotel. Another set of horses who had been sleeping in the hotel would pull the, the barge to the next, next hotel. Um, and somehow that building for the LDDC, the London Legacy uh, Development, uh, LDDC, LDDC uh, Community uh, uh, Corporation, thank you, um, felt that it was a building worth preserving. Uh, and there was this funny structure in front of it, and we kept it. And, we, and then th that's the horse hotel. And then we added another three levels, and then we added two stories above uh, a concrete structures in front of it. It was already a building that was made up of different buildings, but we continued that kind of quality of, of this is a really ugly word, but that word, that word is still worth saying, which is aggregation, that, that nothing is, is seen as a whole, everything is seen as added to each other. Uh, and that is the, the planning application. So. Um, Dark brick and bronze, steel structure, raw concrete, black timber, brick, and then probably black timber at the back here. But I'm, I'm really fond of that building because you know, as you walk along the canal, you get that, a, a richness of your eye. The eye never goes to sleep because there is too much to keep you, your eye interested. This is the back. And those three stories above it. <laughs> these, are, these are the windows for the horses, so they're really high. So on the other side, we had to put low windows so people could see out. And this is the courtyard. So we, we were able to, rather than put all the mass of the building here with the views of the canal, we said, let's make it as deep as possible so as many people as possible can see into, into this courtyard and out to the water. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh, fine. Uh, Rich Estate is a building that we designed with uh, Phil Coffey and HMM. We're in charge of the master plan and doing most of the, of the design. But there was this kind of very square 
and existing building and so on. And possibly by luck, I guess, we were asked to do the kind of this, the building at the very center, not seen from the street or very little by the, from the street. Um, and we felt that it, everything had, it was so square that it was, there needed to be something that was voluptuous and sensual at the center of this, this courtyard. And yet the budget didn't allow us to do full curvy building. So we, we thought that it's actually a square building with a curved envelope. And the curved envelope becomes the support of the balcony and the winter gardens. But the main building is actually a very rectilinear building. And then it's just the, the curve is made out of uh, perforated steel and kind of creates a moment of contrast with everything else surrounding it. And all the time thinking about you know, that and that and this and the trees and all those things are as important as the building in, in our mind because they are the things that you touch, the things that you that are soft, that uh, that 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 ninety nine percent of people experience rather than just inside the flats. And that was that's the moment we we won the the kind of the the QS battle. Ah, it's a very straightforward building. It's very square, and this is just the delicate edge on the outside. And that delicate edge is working really hard to provide outdoor amenity spaces and and winter gardens. I'm a real fan of winter gardens because every every you know. Legally, you have to provide five square meters for a one bedroom and seven square meters of terrace for a, a two bedroom and so on and so forth. And you, you, you look around London and you see two miserable chairs and a round table, always empty, the occasional person smoking a cigarette on their terrace. But people don't, you know, you never see a child playing on a terrace. You never see, um, you know, two old people sort of having a cup of tea on the terrace. Because they're too cold, and you know, if they were in Italy or in uh, Buenos Aires, that would be different. But in England, winter gardens are just like S Scandinavia or, or Holland or elsewhere, uh, the best solution for an amenity space that can be closed, and you can have wonderful plants that sus sustain that that lives through the winter, and then on the few summer days, you open them up. Um, that was a short project. Um, I like this project a lot. This is in Barking. It's called Vicarage Field. Uh, the site was a site of a kind of old tired shopping center in the center of Barking. Uh, the sort of place with a one pound shop sort of place. Uh, and the, the station is here and the, the site is just here. HMM and uh, and a few other people have put a new library and a new square and and made parking have taken parking from there to there and we're sort of taking it maybe to the next stage. We replaced we've put a new uh, shopping center, but we've also sort of our ambition was how. One of my favorite buildings is the Barbican. How can, what would be the Barbican, you know, what are the failures and the mistakes of the Barbican? And how could we make the Barbican better? Which is quite a hard and pretentious task, actually, because a Barbican is pretty good. But it was about, you know, how to put as much greenery at ground level on the podium, how to put a new school, how to create a, to put a hotel, and how to, Put the height so that and, and to locate it in such a way that they didn't overshadow each other. And and for, for me the first thing was how do you rethink the shopping center and not cover it? You I want a shopping center to have the rain falling in it. And then how do you create as much vegetation as possible? And how do you create for it to be efficient? It had to be on two stories. But how do you make those high, high levels still attractive and popular? 
And again, how do you make the paving really as beautiful as a Gaudi cathedral? Um, and how do, you, how do you avoid making a tower that is completely relentlessly repeatable and, and, and create these kind of moments of surprise in the elevation? And maybe how to use different colors and different materials? So I, I really like this plan because um, this is parking, the station is here, and we've created this passage along here that is a new street, and then we've created bridges and bridges, and then we've created this podium, and rather than say um, it's all grass, we said it's going to be pockets of grass, and they're like allotments and, they, and children's play area, but because you're in a tower and you're looking down, they should be really well delineated. And so from the sketch that you saw, okay, it's had it's kind of changed from the sketch, but the essence is the floor is still interesting, the rain is still falling in there, the the upper level is still green, the staircase is taking you and inviting you at the top, the tower changes and it has moments of surprises. It's this material is different is a different colour from this one. And and the, and the shimmer and the reflectivity of, the, of those balconies give, bring light down and at night time you can imagine how they, they're much more inviting. And then we avoided the, the kind of, and put the signage behind the glass as they successfully did at uh, St. Pancras Station. Um, and then just kept a little bit of brick at ground level to make the, uh, friends with the buildings that are already there embarking. And yes, I know it's a shopping center, but it's a bloody good shopping center, you know, and one that people might want to go to. Uh, and there's really, really like the towers feel like they've got legs. They don't really have legs, but they feel like they have legs, and they feel like they're floating above the, the, the rest. And the school has these wonderful color panels. And at nighttime, you just feel like, again, that sense of, aggregation. It's not one big thing. It's an, a number of things coming together. And then those circles that you saw of, of, the, of, the, of the podium allotments and play area are, are really inviting little spaces. And, and then the water, the irrigated by the rain falling at the top of the building, and these pipes bring the water to the irrigation of the spaces. This is the plan, there's a cinema, there is a restaurant, there is, uh, and then above there is small townhouses. And so uh, Vicarage Field is uh, really a project I like a lot. Um, the Showreel building is a building that we were a sort of a project that got killed at Brexit. Brexit killed a few projects, and a few <coughs> projects came after breakfast, Brexit. So uh, Brexit was good and bad, I guess. It's well, it was bad, but it was good and bad. Um, the Showreel building was a really nice building <coughs> in West London for the, in, within the Royal Borough of uh, Kensington. Um, and it was a co-working space. Uh, and it, it's kind of uh, people who think about office spaces are thinking differently than they did 10 years ago. So I think uh, Second, Second Life building in, in um, Shoreditch kind of started this idea that, ah, you, you don't have to have a five-year lease to have an office there. You can rent it for the day or for a week or for a month or for a year. Um, and this, this was the sketch that for me captured the idea of people working together and being able to connect from one floor to another and a big atrium and light coming down to these, these shafts. And, and then on the outside it was next to a, 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 a tube station and a railway and we wanted this building to be really curved. Uh, I guess partly because it was quite big for its surroundings and by curving the building we felt that we were being less offensive to the eye. But also because so many people are on this train 
and they would see this building that would change color and tonality because of the show. And so this is called Fre Freston Street, and the first three levels are for young people to start their business, and as they become more successful, they can then rent a space at the top. This terrace becomes uh, public to all the people, and then below there is recording studios, maker studios, uh, filmmaking studios, exhibition spaces. So a, a really, uh, uh, this is like the, contemp the contemporary version of an office space where it's, it's for your generation. You know, you're happy with an iPad and a cup of coffee and you can work downstairs, upstairs. Here. This is the sort of building you would, you would love. Uh, it's transparent. Uh, it has good coffee. It has people that are of different kind of, of, of creating within the creative businesses do different things, and you can co-work with each other. Um, so, uh, auditorium, exhibition space, workshops, and then slowly as you go up, the atrium becomes. Uh, this is maybe the clever thing about it is that the, the fresh air comes in through the center, is distributed through the floors, and then the, the foul air disappears into the main atrium space. And then that main atrium space allows us to have a really deep floor plan, <coughs> and then the f uh, fresh air and daylight come down, and fresh uh, fre fre uh, foul air leaves the building. That's the plan. And we, we had to work quite hard to convince people that the efficiency of a curved plan was as efficient as a square plan, which is... And the, I mean, say, but how does a client put their paintings on the wall? And said, well, just put a few, a few straight lines. So we, we, we changed the plan a little bit to, to, to allow for paintings on the wall. Um, I, I think this might be the last project. This, is, this project is on site, it's going to finish in about six, seven, eight months' time. It's in Bath. It's probably the only curved building apart from the <coughs> Circus and the, and the Crescent uh, in, uh, in Bath. And what, was really, what is really nice about Bath is that even when buildings have to meet US regulations, Bath comes and says, yes, but it has to be made of stone. And, and then suddenly you have this wonderful question to resolve of how to curve stone on the, on the building. Um, and it was, we, we probably came to Bath just at the right time when we thought they wanted us to make a straight building. And this councillor said, I think it's time we had some curved buildings in Bath and our brains are curved and our buildings should be curved. And she was a little bit cookie, but she... She, she managed to um, <laughs> help us design a curved building. Um, and so we went, you know, from a square to a curve, and from a curve had to kind of erode, erode the curve and step them. And actually, because it's curved, but because it steps back, it becomes an eight-story building that feels like a five- or six-story building. Um, and we wanted all these setbacks to be really not projecting balconies or not recessed balconies, but actually uh, like, a, like a ziggurat, like a, a moment where the building gets shorter and then shorter and shorter, a bit like a, the, ba the Babel Tower. Um, and, and to try and, and, and include as much vegetation as possible on the facade. So then stone and, and vegetation become the key element. And then the, the other thing was that every recesses that we would put would have a, a, a color. And when we went to visit Bath, we went to the Roman Baths, and there was this waterfall, and, and because the, the water has this iron in it, it had made the, the stone all orange. And we thought, that's, so that's a valid, you know, we can go to English heritage and talk about the color orange being on stone being a, a viable solution. And so you can just see the orange in all the recesses, the stone, and then all the balconies, all the balustrades of balconies in, in Bath are 
really shallow and really quite beautifully cast cast iron. And instead of using cast iron, we used we looked at the the pattern on the on the Brunel's bridge, and we we kind of follow that same pattern along here, kind of really delicate touch. Um, and and this building is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stories tall, but it appears to be much, and 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 it had to be curved. Well, that was our argument at least. Uh, because it ha it was it's a pavilion. It is actually people can walk along all around it. it. Doesn't have a front or a back. So it, when you don't have a front or back, you have one more reason to to make it sensual and curved and soft. Uh, this was the sort of the, the story the story of how we made this building. The facade, really delicate fenestration main entrance leading to an atrium building, restaurant ground level, restaurant ground level, and then really efficient, beautiful flats, very few corridors, always that sense that you arrive in the main space and the rooms just come out of the main space. And, and then subtracted spaces <coughs> or the setbacks of the facade, and the setback of the facade. the last picture <laughs> sorry <laughs>